Um, okay, yeah. So yeah, today's talk is going to be on a paper that was in Fox called Iterated Online Bipartite Matching. This is joint work with Ji Huang, Mozu Tao, and then Morteza Zadeh Bukharam. And I can give a bit of a backstory on this on this result, but it is um, kind of a, it's, it's gone through a sequences and ultimately this paper was a bit of a merger uh, between kind of the original idea that Morteza had a while ago and then kind of it's gone through gone through some refinements. And so yeah, today we're going to talk about uh, the result and ultimately like, now kind of relies on uh, a clean sort of subroutine that one can take away and apply to other online optimization algorithms. So the, the majority of the talk will be kind of focused on this main ingredient, which we call online correlated selection, but we'll see how it all kind of comes together at a high level. And so before beginning and kind of going over the problem and then the analysis and, and algorithm, uh, I just want to yeah, make it clear as, as most people do, feel free to interrupt and uh, make the talk. Um, you know, relatively interactive, it's more fun that way. And also try and keep it, yeah, not at a high level, um, like at a high level, more so that we can see how all these tools gonna come together. I think that's the, if there's one thing to take away, it's this subroutine, which we'll call OCS, and then kind of just understanding um, how, yeah, the framework that all of this uh, kind of lives in and how, how the tools come together. Um, so with that, gonna start and um, give some introduction to online matching. And uh, from there, we'll kind of, uh, Kind of work through a bit of the paper. So um, the edge-weighted online bipartite matching problem um, is the following problem. We're given as input um, a edge-weighted bipartite graph, uh, so we'll call the left-hand side vertices L, right-hand side vertices R, and we have a weight function that we apply to all edges, and we'll assume the bipartite graph is complete with you know non-existing edges being zero, uh, having weight zero. And so in the online matching case, uh, we'll say that the left-hand side vertices are the offline uh, vertices, the, and the algorithm knows this set of uh, nodes in advance. Now, from the algorithm's perspective, the right-hand side vertices arrive online one at a time, and each time a um, uh, vertex arrives on the online vertex, all of its um, edges, uh, so its incidence um, to the offline vertices are revealed to the algorithm, including their weights, and the algorithm has to make um, an irrevocable like matching decision at that point in time before seeing you know the, any future vertices uh, that come online and so and I say oh, oh if any here too it can decide not to make a match and so we'll have this sort of toy example uh, largely actually throughout the talk it's pretty pretty helpful um, and for now we'll just kind of think of the unweighted case just to set up the problem but this is the instance that say like an adversary would ultimately feed to the algorithm and so the algorithm starts as follows it knows the left hand side vertices the offline ones it receives, you know, it, it then sees the first on, online vertex, it arrives, and it sees that it's incident to both of the two offline vertices. And so at this point, the algorithm has to make some kind of decision. And without loss of general, at this point, it doesn't know what's coming. So let's say it makes this decision. It just matches to the top offline, ver offline vertex. And then now the next online vertex comes, and we see that it's adjacent to the vertex that has already been matched now. And so there's nothing that it can really do, it's blocked. Uh, from a previous decision. So this like small little example illustrates some of the difficulty here, where the algorithm ultimately output a size, a matching size one, but clearly we can see if it had chosen a different first step, um, it could have achieved a matching of size two. And so the whole point of this uh, talk and paper is kind of showing a way to sort of um, sort of enhance, you know, the greedy algorithm um, in a way to do a little bit better than kind of getting a, a one half approximation in the edge-weighted case. Uh, but so now um, for the edge-weighted edge -weighted bipartite matching problem, it generalizes you know, max ma uh, unweighted matching in the natural way. The goal is to maximize the total weight of the matched edges. Um, so we're going to sum over the edges that appear in the matching, sum their weights. So that's our objective. And we define the sort of competitive competitiveness of an algorithm uh, via the competitive ratio. And so it's a standard definition. But we'll say that the competitive ratio of an algorithm is the minimum of the of a randomized algorithm is the minimum of the expected output of the algorithm over the the offline um, like optimum value, um, and then we take this min over all possible instances, and then all possible um, orderings of, of the right hand side vertex. All right, so it's essentially all instances, and the model here we have to work in is what's called the oblivious adversary model. This is just kind of like formally really setting up all the pieces, um, but the adversary has to fix the input. Um, ahead of time, and then you can't change the input based on the randomness of the, the algorithm 
the decisions of the randomness that appear in the algorithm. Um, so the, the instance just has to be fixed and we feed it to the algorithm. Um, so Matthew, yes. uh, are you allowing you uh, yourself to discard edges and stuff like that? Because if you're looking at the weighted case, I was yes. worried. Right, right. So yeah, that's um, next slide here, but we need, yeah, we need one other assumption for this problem to really make sense in the edge weighted generalization. Otherwise it is, it is too hard to, to really give a meaningful algorithm. And so, yes. Yeah, could you go back a yes, second? Yeah. Sure. Okay, why is that the min instead of the max? Um, You're trying to find, oh, the minimum, see over oh, the graph, if, you, if you're fixing the algorithm, right? Um, well, no, no, no uh, yes, we're fixing the algorithm. You're fixing the algorithm and you're try trying all different inputs of it. Wouldn't the competitive ratio be the worst the algorithm could perform? Uh, yes. Um, maybe it should be some kind of um, min max. Let's see. No, if it's the max, there's, it, there is an instance. Uh, we could just have a single um, simple graph with one node on each side, and the algorithm will always output uh, have a ratio of one. We're, we're considering all instances. So, okay. Danny, the ratio is less than one, so it is a minimum. So, it's just. So, Matthew, so why is expectation interesting? Like for instance, uh, for instance, if you're doing spark graph sparsification, right. you can generate a graph with a single edge and an expectation it's equivalent, spectrally equivalent to the whole graph. But it's not yeah, that yeah. interesting. It's unless you have concentration, it's not interesting. Uh, that's a fair point. So yeah, this is the standard definition. We're working from that. I, I feel like that's, yeah, maybe more of a, a deeper like criticism of- But is there any reason analysis. why it could be the case that most of the time you get no, nothing interesting? And now and then, with very high prob with some other probability, you get everything or something. I mean, it could just be. It seems like you want some kind of, you know, tail estimates or something. Yeah, yeah, no, this this makes sense. Um, yeah, perhaps there's instances where this is the case, uh, but, but yeah, I don't know how like how uh, this has really like formally been studied. Um, but yeah, kind of just working from the the standard framework of competitiveness and online algorithms. But I agree. Uh, perhaps, yeah, there are instances where this is like truly pretty meaningless statement. Um, doesn't seem that way, but. Anyway, yeah. regarding my question, I, I, I think I, I just missed, your algorithm is trying to find a maximum of something. Correct. Not a minimum of something. That, that right. was my conclusion. Okay. okay, okay. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, thanks for asking about the clarification. Okay, so we'll carry onwards. And there's, there's one other assumption that we need here for this edge-weighted ed edge weighted bipartite matching problem to, to really make sense. And there's this observation that um, you, need, you need some additional assumption. The assumption here is what's called the free disposal assumption. And the idea is that an offline vertex can um, sort of rematch itself. It can drop um, an edge that has been assigned to it if there is a higher value candidate uh, that comes later on. So we, we need to be able to kind of do some replacement Otherwise we can get stuck in, in a very bad way. Uh, and so I'll say that this assumption was first introduced in a, a paper by Feldman et al. in one 2009, um, motivated by uh, the display as allocation problem at Google. And kind of the underlying idea here is it's just, it's, it's sort of a natural economic interpretation. Um, advertisers, do, you don't mind receiving something of higher quality um, you know, uh, than, than you paid for it. So anyway, that's, that's where this first originated this idea. Um, so anyway, we need to make this kind of assumption. Uh, so to be clear, the, um, the heavier in that sentence is very important, right? Because without the heavier, you'd just be allowed to arbitrarily reassign it every iteration. Um, let's see. Well, if you assign it a lower weight edge, then you're, you're, never, you're, you're making less progress towards the objective at that point. Uh, that's fair enough. No, but I think it's also the fact that you're only allowed to make that one change. Right, you're not allowed to re redo the entire matching. You're just saying correct, correct. When correct. a new one comes in, you can rematch. You can correct replace. So the, the, yeah. Right, the objective oh, here, is, yeah, yeah. The I objective have. here is really think about all the match, all the things that have been assigned to an offline node, and then when you compute the objective, kind of any step, take the max that it has received at that point. Don't sum the things that have been given to it. Just take the max. I see. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry if I wasn't clear. Um, but that is our how how we define the the. Uh, state of an algorithm, like the state of our, our matching. Okay, so a bit of um, a backstory, so kind of some history of the like direct lineage of the problem, the direct generalizations. The online bi bipartite matching problem in the unweighted case was introduced by Kart Balzarani Balzarani 
1990. This is kind of a, the seminal, seminal paper to kick off online matching in general. And they show that this uh, kind of famous algorithm called ranking achieves a one minus one over E competitive ratio. And they also give a type, um, an instance that, that show that this is tight. Um, then in uh, yeah, 2011, Agarwal et al. generalizes to the vertex weighted case where the offline, you, the offline vertices have weights and the quality of uh, basically the objective here is you sum over the um, offline vertices that have a matched edge and you sum their weights. And they basically generalize ranking uh, to also show that you can do one minus one free. Now the edge weighted online bipartite matching case is a folklore result that the greedy alg algorithm gives you one half uh, competitive ratio. And it's a natural generalization of the vertex weighted bipartite matching uh, problem. Uh, this work shows how we can do slightly better uh, and achieve a like, 0 0.5086 competitive ratio. And we do so by kind of augmenting the greedy in some kind of way. And now a further generalization of edge weighted online bipartite matching with the free disposal assumption is the submodular welfare maximization problem. And um, here, it's also been known that the, the greedy gives you one half and Karpolov et al showed in 2013 that the upper bound here is actually tight, um, um, assuming yeah, kind of standard hardness assumptions. So what this really does, um, you know, assuming these hardness assumptions hold is that this, this paper also shows a separation between these two problems, which is kind of a, a secondary contribution of the work. So that's a bit of history of kind of the, the direct, um, you know, the directly related problems. And I'll say, so again, uh, the main results here is that we achieve a 0 0.5086 competitive algorithm for edge weight online by party matching with free disposal. So i.e. we can replace, um, you know, update the, the values that can match an edge uh, to an offline vertex. And the key idea is we're gonna take the greedy algorithm and we're gonna introduce some kind of like negative correlation along the way. So it's gonna keep some notion of like previous assignments, but not too much. Um, and we do so in a random way. And then we're gonna exploit the variance set um, you know, ultimately happens in this correlated randomness. So I'll explain this mechanic. Um, that's kind of the, the, the whole point of the talk, is this idea. And so with that, um, any questions before I dive into a couple, um, couple more related works and then we'll, then we'll get going. Okay, cool. Well, I wanna draw two connections. There's two problems that generalize the edge weighted by online bipartite matching problem. And they're not necessarily generalizations of each other. So I want to point them out because they're um, popular works in the online matching uh, field. So the first is the display as problem. And so I just kind of want to illustrate basically where our result sits relative to state of the arts um, in, in kind of better understood problems. And the first is general, uh, the generalization called display as problem. And here, what the offline vertices do is they have capacity constraints. So rather than just taking the maximum the, the single maximum edge that gets assigned to it, it's going to take the top C, where C is, um, you know, C sub i dependent on each offline vertex. And this is the value of um, the matching in some sense. It's just kind of like a multi, like a B matching or multi matching. And so the display has problem, uh, right? Each offline vertex can receive multiple matches up to some um, capacity C sub i. And what's known is also in this uh, paper by Feldman et al. that introduced the free disposal assumption is they say the following. There exists an algorithm with a uh, competitive ratio one minus one over E, and this is optimal under the following assumptions. We make, we allow for free disposal. And this, this holds basically as the capacities go to infinity. So basically saying, um, right, we take everything that gets matched to it. Um, so what this paper does in particular is it kind of shows that we don't need this large capacity assumption. In our case, we're studying the capacity equals one case where we just take the max. And we're still, still showing that we make some kind of progress past one half. Okay, so that's display as problem where you have capacity. There's also a uh, generalization known as the AdWords problem uh, where we have some kind of like budgeted allocation. So rather than taking the top C sub I can, like matches per offline vertex, we take all the matches up till some budget um, that sits on that threshold, uh, that sits on top of that offline vertex. And so it's not kind of the number of assigned edges. It, it looks at the sum of the weights of those edges that have been assigned to it. And the reason I point that, this out is for two reasons. Um, so Meta et al. in uh, 2005, this, is the real, this paper is like the first real generalization of the Fadner-Fazarani Fazarani paper, show that one can achieve um, an algorithm with competitive ratio of one minus one over E. It's optimal. But again, here they make this sort of small bids assumption 
where they assume the budget is basically infinite. This competitive ratio holds as the, bit, the budget goes to infinity. And so I say this because um, kind of analogously, Wang Zing Zing um, and Fox 2020 also use this um, online correlated selection tool that we introduced in this paper to similarly break the one half barrier for this problem, um, kind of in the general bid sense where you don't need this large bids assumption. Um, so I just kind of really, this is really just setting the stage to show kind of A, that the online correlated selection tool um, is useful in this kind of problem. And then B, just kind of showing where this fits, show, showing where our result fits in kind of more popularly studied problems. Okay, so then the last thing I'm just gonna mention um, is kind of also like somewhat in line with uh, Gary's, Gary's question earlier is um, our adversary arrival is too pessimistic. So do we need to really consider worst case? And so, yeah, there's, there's a variety of results. I'm just gonna kind of mention them here. Um, that way they're, they're here on the recording and someone wants to look at them later. But there's assumptions that can be made um, about the way in which the online vertices arrive. So be it you know that they're being drawn from some distribution or uh, rather than the worst case, you are necessarily gonna permute them beforehand. Um, there's ways to kind of beat these kind of one minus one over B barriers that appear naturally. And similarly, a, a very cool area of study is uh, the notion of designing algorithms that work well in the worst case um, and in some kind of stochastic case, if you know that they're being drawn, the online vertices are being drawn from some distribution. So these algorithms kind of give simultaneous approximations and are the same algorithm. Um, so these are like kind of stronger in some sense, um, although they're really not, but um, yeah, kind of you get more bang for your buck. So anyway, I just wanted to mention a couple um, other very like uh, well-known papers once you kind of loosen up the worst case analysis assumption. Okay, so any questions? If not, we're gonna dive into the okay, the main, main ingredient, which we call online correlated selection. So Matthew, just to check, we yes. are still looking at the, the, the simplest uh, weighted online matching problem. Correct, correct. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so what I, what I mentioned were generalizations of that problem that have been well studied. All right, and so we're going to do this, um, right? We're, we're, we're still in this framework, but to do this, we're actually going to, to understand this, this kind of key subroutine. We're gonna, at the moment, kind of step back and just kind of uh, think of the unweighted matching problem. We're gonna show how one can generalize the unweighted online bipartite matching problem, um, kind of using this, this technique where we augment the greedy algorithm. And then we'll be able to show that this naturally generalizes to the edge-weighted case. So, um, with that, we'll look at, uh, yeah, this online correlated selection idea. And so I mentioned, yeah, it's the key ingredient for this kind of algorithm to get past the one half competitive ratio. And we're gonna motivate it with a bit of like a thought experiment where we're gonna look at some algorithms, see what goes wrong and gradually fix this until we're able to make it right. And we're gonna do so uh, by looking at the unweighted online backward dimension problem. So the first algorithm called algorithm zero, just the deterministic greedy algorithm. So it's well known that all deterministic greedy algorithms are at most one half competitive. The idea being kind of what we saw early in the very uh, early on like toy kind of uh, example is that if we know exactly how the algorithm is gonna behave, uh, there's a simple kind of, uh, you know, this, this graph you can essentially do, but if you know how it's gonna make its first decision, then you can uh, basically figure out where to assign the second online vertex and you're always gonna, it's always gonna get stuck, block in some way. So what this basically says is you need some element of randomness. To, to do better than one half. So to fix this, the idea, rather than taking the, make, basically making your match to some offline vertex that gives you the most gain to the objective in each step, we're going to now kind of uh, come up with this, what we'll call the independent random bits version of this, where we're gonna look at the two top candidates. When each online vertex arrives, we look at the offline vertices find the two offline vertices, if there are two, they give us the most gain, for the objective, if we assign to them, and we'll flip a coin and make our assignment that way. And so I'm gonna take some time to kind of like really explain this framework because the algorithm that we give at the end of the day is gonna be a slight modification of this uh, once we kind of use the uh, underlying online correlated selection like black box. And so this is the two choice greedy algorithm uh, with independent random bits. So it works as follows. Um, so 
for each online vertex J that arrives, we're going to compute, um, find a set of candidates, which we'll call B. And these are the offline vertices, um, in this case, that are least likely to be matched to J. So um, in, the online in the unweighted case, this just means vertices that um, have not yet been matched. Um, what we mean by least likely, we'll kind of have to, I'll, I'll explain this more formally, but there's kind of a way to keep track of um, how likely something is to have been matched. So we're going to compute some computable set of basically best candidates, B. And then if there are none, we're just going to discard the online vertex that arrives. This is an unmatched round. If there Matthew, are, can I yes. ask a question? Sure thing. When you say least likely matched, do you mean like conditioned on the past history of the younger? Exactly. Or so sorry, of the arrivals. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So in this case, yeah, it's kind of like we almost need to see bullet point three here first to really understand what that means. But in each step, we're if we have two at least two candidates, so we have two top candidates, we're going to do a coin flip and we're going to make the assignment that way. And so the probability of a vertex having been matched um, is you know a function of the number of times it's been a top two candidate. So yeah, the least likely vertices to have been matched are the ones that have appeared in the fewest number of rounds, and therefore will give the most gain in expectation. Uh, yeah, yeah, so this is kind of like almost like some circular. Uh, Sorry, one logic. more question is when you're talking about the two, like the two best neighbors, are those the two best unmatched neighbors or the two best neighbors, period? Right. So, um, yeah, this gets into the subtlety of the algorithm. Uh, and we'll explain it in the next slide. So, the okay. algorithm never fully realizes its decisions in the past, it's always operating in an expected state. So it knows that there's, you know, if, if an offline vertex has appeared as a neighbor and as a candidate in K rounds, the probability that it's unmatched is one minus, um, you know, uh, to one half to the K kind of thing. So we compute, that's what I mean kind of by least matched is a function of the number of times it's appeared as a neighbor. Um, so yeah, the, uh, the following example will illustrate that. Um, but right, so if there's two, two candidates, we're gonna take two of them. Uh, lexicography at least to keep it simple. And then we flip a coin and like, regardless of previous decisions, we make the assignment uh, to one of these two neighbors. And then if there's only one, one candidate, um, this is essentially just deterministic, we make the match that way. So, right. Um, are, there, are there any more questions? I will, I will kind of quantify what least likely match means with the, the following example. But again, it's, Basically, the probability that an offline vertex has been matched is going to be that it's basically unmatched is one minus one half to the k, where k is the number of times it's it's appeared as a previous top two candidate. And so, when I say least likely, I really mean we're just looking at the number, keeping track of the number of times you know, offline vertexes have been a top two candidate. I guess I'm confused <clears throat> with the model because you know you have to make a decision online, right, for yes. every vertex. Yes. So why does it matter? You're sort of saying you're keeping in mind, the algorithm is keeping in mind all possible futures, even though only one of them has actually been, you know, instantiated. So, no, no, but so it's actually the other way around. I don't, I don't, okay, I don't understand the model. Yeah, yeah, so it's not the uh, futures that it's keeping track of, it's keeping track of the, the past assignments that it could have made. So it's never- Even though, even though it already made a decision about right. that. Right, 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 exactly. Yeah, so it's not realizing its decision. So in some sense, you would argue that uh, it should realize its decision and not do like redundant work. Um, but in order to make progress in the edge-weighted problem and to get a competitive ratio greater than one half, um, it, it, it seemed necessary to us, at least you know, as the first iteration of making progress on this problem, that you kind of need to keep, uh, keep things in this expected state. Okay, and that, is that because of the ability to, to do the replacement rule? Or it's not called replacement, what's it called? Oh, the free disposal? For, yeah, the free disposal rule. Right, that helps, but it's also just um, the analysis itself is quite difficult to, to, to push through and kind of break this, break this one half barrier. And so operating the expected, like operating in its expected state, um, yeah, just kind of, um, I don't know, like simply makes things easier in some sense. It's more tractable. Are you going to explain how those probabilities are computed or yeah, is that I, that's implicit in this calculation with one half? Yeah, in this case, it's, it's simple with the one half. I mean, simple once you see it written down. Um, 
in the in the weighted case, there there are formulas that we use to okay. to to kind of the analogous of least matched in a weighted case because it's no longer uniform. It's no longer no longer just keeping track of things that counts. Yeah, but I, I will explain this. And so here's a bit of an example of kind of what's happening. So we start with this uh, you know input, and the algorithm doesn't uh, know what the online like the full instance. It just knows the offline vertices. The first vertex comes. And it sees we have two, two equally good candidates. And so it's going to flip its coin and make an assignment to one of these two offline vertices. Uh, and then, but it doesn't fully realize this decision. Now, in the next step, the second vertex comes and it only has one match. And so here it's going to make its assignment. And um, so the point of this example is really showing that by introducing some kind of randomness, you can do better on some instances than what the greedy algorithm would have done just by itself. Um, so here now the expected output of the algorithm is three halves. So Matthew, yes. I don't understand two things. One is I don't understand what you mean by it doesn't fully realize its, uh, its uh, randomness. Right, so what I mean by that is the following, that in each step when it's, a, when it's computing the best candidates, it's it's not exact. It's not looking at the true assignments that it's made. It's looking at the, okay. the expected assignments that it's made over the previous random decisions up to that point. So, in each each randomized round, it's going to take two candidates and make a uh, a random assignment between those two. Okay. Maybe it'll help if you explain exactly what what you star the, the state that you star. Um, wait. What do you mean by that? Well, you are saying it doesn't fully realize it starts some kind of expected state. So right. it, it's storing, yeah, some kind of expected state. Yeah, it, so what it is storing is the prob for each offline vertex, the probability that uh, that edge is like uh, matched given the previous decisions at that point. Is it, is it reasonable to just think of this as a fractional algorithm? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the primal dual kind of kind of hints at that. The primal dual analysis that comes later. Yeah. So basically, the, the best candidates are the ones that have the um, are least likely to be matched. They they have been involved in fewer randomized rounds previously, because if they've been involved in many randomized rounds, then there's a good chance because they were one of two candidates that it would have received an edge, and now it's going to be blocked in the future. So you want to choose offline offline candidates in this unweighted case that have appeared in very few randomized rounds in the past. Those are the ones that are most likely to be unmatched now and therefore have more gain um, to the objective downstream. So yeah, this is, this is a bit weird, but it's, it's truly like necessary for the edge weighted analysis, like the weighted case analysis to go through. Matthew, okay. one more thing, I, you know, sure. how can BJ be zero? I mean, it's the least likely candidate. I mean, it, if there is a candidate, at least one of them will be least likely. I, I oh, don't understand. So, that. so, so that is true. So, well, it's okay. The way that that would work is you have potentially deterministic rounds. So you have, um, if there's an online vertex that appears that is adjacent to an, an online vertex, an offline vertex, we will make that match. Okay. And then going forward, we know that that's a useless candidate because it with certainty has been matched in the past. Okay. Does, does that make sense? Yeah, so there, there's occasionally, you, you, yeah, even in expectation, you do sometimes know that vertices are saturated, that they're blocked, offline, vert offline vertices. Okay. So, right. Okay, so now what we know though is that the there's still, this doesn't completely fix things. The two choice greedy algorithm, if we, even if we make a, a coin flip at each step, um, it's still one half competitive. So the same hardness results that appear in the karp Pazirani paper kind of apply here. This kind of, there's a family of upper triangular graphs that show that you still kind of get stuck by doing this. Okay. And now I wanna show that even in the um, unweighted uh, case, that it's, it's possible to kind of still do better than one half. And that introduces this idea of what happens if we have negative perfect, perfect correlation. And I'll say what that means here. So if we have this following kind of um, this kind of imaginary property, where um, where 
it says the following, each offline vertex is matched um, with certainty if it's been a candidate in at least two randomized rounds. So if an offline vertex has appeared twice as a top match, by the end of that second time, uh, we know that it has received an edge by the, from the algorithm. So this doesn't always hold there are graphs where this is infeasible, but if we have this property, then this two choice kind of greedy algorithm with perfect negative correlation is five nights competitive. So it's, it's better than the greedy in some way. And moreover, it's tight. So, so again, so rather than just making a random assignment, if we have, if we have this property where um, an offline vertex has appeared twice as um, a top candidate, at the end of that second time, it's definitely been matched. Like if we know that for sure, then one can do better than one half in the unwinning case. And this is kind of the path forward to potentially generalize to the edge weighted case. We want some notion of sort of negative correlation uh, to arise in the algorithm. Okay, and so the main kind of yeah, guiding question is, can we then uh, use par partial negative correlation? So not perfect, not, not this perfect sense where we know it's matched for sure, but better than random in some way and get past the one half barrier in the edge weighted case. Um, but the goal is here, we want to retain feasibility. It needs to work for all instances. And okay, so this is the kind of the key, the key component of the paper and kind of key idea to take away in general is that there's this way to interpolate between flipping a coin at each step and having so this notion of perfect negative correlation where we guarantee that something's been matched after being a candidate twice, a top two candidate twice. And so the definition is this. We call it a, a gamma semi-OCS. And it says, so fix the value of this, this parameter that is like basically the correlation strength parameter gamma. And we say gamma semi-OCS, it's its own online algorithm that takes as input um, a sequence of pairs of elements from some universe. So in each step, it's receiving a pair of elements and it selects one pair uh, at each step um, such that if an element I appears in at least K pairs up, up to that time step, the probability that I has been selected is greater than one minus one half to the K times one minus gamma to the K minus one. And I'm gonna illustrate what this means, but basically if we set gamma to zero, we just recover the independent random bits algorithm. The guarantee is just one minus one half to the K. And if we set gamma equal to one, then once it's appeared twice, we know that I has been selected with probability one. So basically what it's doing is the number of times it's appeared as a top two candidate um, to, the, to the OCS, like in this stream of pairs, uh, we can boost the chance that it's appeared, uh, you know, that it's selected um, in a way that's better than random. And so really the, the core theorem at the heart of this uh, result is that there is, there is a way to materialize this kind of online algorithm. And there's a way, yeah, there exists an OCS with gamma equal to 0. 0.1099. And I'll just say here, and then we can take a look at it if we have time later on, but there's a very simple way to get a 1 16th um, OCS. And this is sufficient for breaking all of these one half barriers. We just need a positive value of gamma. Um, but here's kind of, I wanna, I wanna illustrate this, what this tool is doing. And maybe it'll kind of, um, kind of, it kind of suggests why we may not want to materialize things. Like this OCS doesn't actually materialize its previous decisions either because we need positive probability of having chosen some, like any of the elements that it's seen. Um, so, so suppose our stream here in this example is this, uh, these three pairs, AB, AC, and AB. Then for some like, uh, when we set gamma equal to 0 0.1099, the probability that we've seen A, um, that, that, the, that this OCS online algorithm chooses A at the end of this third pair is greater than or equal to, um, right? This is just kind of plugging into the def definition, but one minus one half to the third times this uh, you know, discount, and we get 0 0.901. Compare this just the random coin flip of 0.875. Same, same for B, because B has appeared in two of the three pairs, the chance of choosing B is greater than um, just you know, the, the random coin flip also. So instead of it being one minus uh, 0.25, we get this, this value, it's just slightly bigger. And then C, because C has just appeared once, you can't do better than the coin flip, the, the OCS doesn't guarantee that. It's once you've seen an element twice or more, 
you've kind of improved its chance of being chosen. So, so this is the subroutine. This is the promise that this OCS on like algorithm gives us. Um, are there any questions about its definition? Basically, gamma is just reducing the the gap um, to one and increasing the probability that's being chosen. And this holds for all elements greater than that have appeared more than once in the stream. Could you explain the the point seven five, just to make sure I understand sure. why that for the for the for the simple algorithm. So, um, exp yeah, yeah. So basically, if if the OCS has been given, um, so if if an element appears in the in the stream more than more than once, the OCS has this promise that it's it's doing better than random in some way, and it's going to increase the odds of um, you getting this. Um, of selecting this element. And so because in this case, up at like basically time step three, B has appeared in two of the three pairs. And so the, the promise that it gives you, so okay, the OCS is choosing one element from the pair in each step. And so the probability of B being chosen at time step three, at least once, is one minus um, this 0.5 squared, which is the coin flip. And then you kind of get this discount um, it's kind of yeah shrinking the gap. So if we just did a coin flip, the probability that it gets, it gets chosen is 0.75. Um, okay. So yeah. Danny, I think if you just flipped a coin independently, there's a like a, a quarter chance that it would be picked in the two rounds. The half chance in the uh, sorry, it, it's a, there's a three quarters chance that it would have been picked, right? It would be exactly. probably half in the first round and condition not being picked, it would be picked half in, half in the second time you saw it. So that would be 75%. And this is picking it with a slightly higher probability. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, so in particular, like an example that isn't here, but if we had like just two pairs like AB and then AB comes again, what this is doing is it's boosting the chance of choosing A and B like together, but it's making decisions um, kind of independently in some sense. Okay, so, okay, yeah. So are there any other questions about the OCS? I just got, yeah, we, we need this kind of promise. We need to know that it's doing better than coin flips. Um, and this is how we quantify that, the independent random coin flips. Well, with that, we can dive in and into the algorithm. Uh, but yeah, we'll, we'll kind of see how, how the algorithm ends up using, using this black box tool. And we'll see then how also this kind of starts to relate, the edge-weighted case relates to the un unweighted case. So there are three main tools that uh, we use in this algorithm. We use kind of the online primal dual method introduced by Devin Ardell in 2013. The complementary, complementary cumulative distribution like function uh, so it's like CCDF viewpoint of basically matching problems introduced by, again, by Devin Arnold in 2016. And then we introduced this third ingredient called online correlated selection to sort of outsource our decisions at each step um, in some kind of uh, negatively correlated way. And the algorithm uses our gamma OCS as a black box and the competitive ratio downstream just depends on, just depends on the value of gamma. Okay. So to kind of set the stage, we start from, okay, and I'll also say that the algorithm itself is really, the algorithm is uh, kind of motivated by the, these analysis tools. So the online primal dual framework uh, for matching problems. So, so Matthew, are you going to say the algorithm again? Oh yes, I, I, I'll show how the algorithm um, kind of is modified for the edge-weighted case, but I'm first going to kind of set it up with the online primal dual um, framework that we need to sort of satisfy because it guides the creation of the algorithm. But yes, I'll, I'll say that. So I guess I'll just say though, yeah, the algorithm at a high level is really basically the same as we saw earlier. Each step for each online vertex, we compute some notion of gains basically. And um, if, we, if, if, it, if we deem that a randomized decision is best, we take the two best candidates at the, for, the, for this um, using these random gain values. And we give the two candidates to the OCS in a black box manner. 
and it makes the assignment for us. And, and that's really all that there is to the algorithm. And if it's a deterministic step, we just make the best deterministic match. Um, so this, co this comes downstream later, but um, yeah, I want to show how we, how we get there via this online primal tool setup. So we start from the um, just kind of standard matching linear program in its tool. So this is the edge-weighted matching linear program on the left-hand side, and then the dual is the right. And so what the dual in these matching, um, matching linear programs look like is basically every node has some value on it. We have offline dual variables alpha and online dual variables beta. And for each edge in the, the graph, we need that the sum of the two dual variables is greater than the edge weight. That's, that's what this is saying. And we have this observation that if we think of xij as the probability that edge ij is the heaviest edge that's matched to uh, the offline vertex i, then this primal value is equal to the expected output of the algorithm. Because um, the output of the algorithm uh, basically sum over the left-hand side offline vertices, and we take the heaviest edge that got matched to that offline vertex. So uh, this will get yeah, spelled out more clearly in a bit. But there's a tool that um, is convenient for proving the competitive ratio of an algorithm, and it's called the Online Primal Dual Framework. And it basically is this following idea. Suppose an online algorithm uh, maintains like primal dual assignments, not necessarily feasible, but some assignments, and then for some value uh, gamma between 0 and 1, if the following always hold, we get some competitive ratio guaranteed. And it's just a simple consequence of linear programming uh, duality. But if, if the following conditions always hold, we get the competitive ratio for free. The first is approximate dual feasibility. So we, we loosen the constraint that the sum of the dual variables is greater than or equal to the edge weight. Uh, we discount it by some value of gamma. So we, we make this easier to satisfy. And then if we also have this idea of reverse weak duality in each step, where the expected output out of the algorithm is greater than the primal dual, is greater than the, the dual um, objective value. So if we can satisfy these, these properties, these inequalities at every step of the online algorithm, then for free, we get that the algorithm is gamma competitive. And so the idea here is really just to design an algorithm that necessarily does these things. So we want to basically design ways to increment the dual variables. Um, and we want to do so for a value of gamma that's strictly greater than 1 half. So yeah, my reason for giving this, which you know, it almost looks like the analysis step, but really we, need, we, we, we are designing an algorithm centered around these promises so that we get um, a guarantee on the competitive ratio. So this is not something we, uh, you know, the online primal dual framework has been used all over the place. But I'm just saying it, it guides the design of our algorithm. Now, uh, so here's how we kind of want to look at this algorithm. And this is just a useful lens uh, to look through these weighted, edge weighted bipartite matching problems. The expected output of the algorithm, well, it's we, we loop over all of the offline vertices on the left hand side. And then for all of its edges, we look at the, um, its neighbors in the, in the right-hand side. And recall that you know, if x, ij is the probability that um, ij is the heaviest edge match to the offline vertex, we take it. So this is kind of just another way. This is connecting the output of the algorithm to the primal objective. And this is kind of rewriting this you know, heaviest, what is the expected heaviest edge match to i this way. But this complementary CDF point of view is a way of kind of unwrapping this expectation kind of in the non-standard way. So, it, so here we're now writing as an integral um, over where we're kind of like uh, summing over the edge weights, the, the possible weight levels in some sense. So we really want to think of, this is kind of this quantity that we're going to want to keep track of. And it's, again, was introduced by this Devin R. all paper in 2016. But we want to keep track of the probability that I is matched to a vertex with weight at least W. And so for each of these like weight thresholds, we're kind of keeping track of this probability of assignment. So we'll think of this as some value y sub i. And so, yeah, this isn't like terribly important, but I just kind of want to say that this is the view from which we analyze things. Um, so we're keeping track of these uh, weight levels y, and it's the probability that an offline vertex has received a match of weight at least w over the, at any time in the algorithm. So in particular, what we think about is like, 
for each of the offline vertices, we have this like weight function, this, this function y um, that sits on top of it. And it's basically keeping track of the probability that a weight of at least some value has been matched to the algorithm at some point, or to that vertex at some point in the algorithm. So what happens is in randomized rounds, say we have, say at some step, time step, we kind of have a, we've, we kept perfect track of the probabilities of, you know, weight assignments to an offline vertex. And it kind of looks like this, where the, the max value is, you know, one um, for some weight, from these weight thresholds. And when a new candidate comes, let's say weight W3, if I is a top two candidate for this weight, for this random assignment, then, then there's some increments, basically. The probability that I has then received an edge of at least weight W3 um, increases for all of these like slabs up to weight W3 by some amount. Um, and moreover, if, if, if it, if, it's, if there's this deterministic round where we know that we're assigning a weight, say W2 to an offline vertex, then we're gonna kind of increase all the slabs up to at least weight W2 to one, because we know we've made a decision. So the main idea here is we wanna kind of just keep track of the probability that an offline vertex has received a weight, an edge of a given weight. And with this, we can recover kind of the, output, the, the expected output of the algorithm, the way of the matching. So we're keeping track of these functions. And then really what we do, so I'm not gonna dive into this too much yet, is the goal, the name of the game is updating the dual variables in some meaningful way. And so we take our offline dual variables and we're gonna kind of break them down by weight level. So again, now we're kind of integrating over all the possible weights that could have been assigned to this uh, offline vertex. So we've decomposed the dual variables into these sort of um, an integral like a dual variable function. And each of these alpha sub i's is a piecewise constant function. And when an online vertex comes and is a potential match of a given weight, uh, we increase this dual variable by some value, this dual variable function like these slabs up to that weight by some value that we determine. And this is what we call like the increment to the dual, to dual, to dual variable. And there's only discontinuities at weight levels, uh, at weights that we've seen up to that point. So it's kind of easy to maintain these things. Um, but I just kind of want to paint this picture that really what we're keeping track of and the algorithm is keeping track of is kind of some lower bound on the probability that um, we've made a match of a given weight to an offline vertex. And we, we do this in a way that we can, that's tractable. And then, Right. We also have to increment the, dual, the, the online dual variables in some way. But the name of the game is really figuring out a way to like distribute the gain that we would get to the primal by making some match to the dual variables in, in, in a way that allows us, to do, allows us to use a gamma greater than one half. So this isn't meant to really be the analysis um, and understanding the analysis, but this guides the design of the algorithm. And so, and shows how we, and shows how we kind of connect these tools. So this is the kind of like pseudo code, the high level idea of the edge weighted online property matching algorithm that achieves competitive ratio greater than one half. And so it has very similar structure to the kind of the uh, example we saw in the thought experiment for the un unweighted case, where when each online vertex arrives, we're gonna compute um, marginal gains. Um, so basically how, you know, making some kind of assignment to the left-hand side vertex affects the objective function given the past. And based on, on these different gains that we uh, compute at each step, we make some kind of decision. So we compute both gains um, as if, if we made a random decision, and then if we made a deterministic assignment just to a single offline variable. And if both are negative, we enter an unmatched round like before. If the deterministic gain is definitely better, um, there's more value there than doing the kind of a random assignment, we'll make a greedy match in this step. Otherwise, if we kind of have these, yeah, we have these randomized like, gain quantities. If both are bigger than the deterministic gain, we take the top two offline vertices that have the most gain, and then we feed them to the OCS. And we like, let the OCS make the decision. And this is where we kind of start to get correlation between rounds. So the, what these gain variables like values are, are not really important, but they are quant like they are 
values we can compute like, in each step uh, very easily. And so, so this is kind of the, the high level idea of the algorithm. This, um, yeah, so wait, are, are, there any, are there any questions kind of uh, here? I guess there's a lot of, there are a lot of things like go into in detail in some sense, but uh, are there any questions about this, the general structure of the algorithm? So Matthew, if I just wanted mm -hmm. to understand uh, your original proposal with the yes. BJ things, and with the correlated uh, OCRS uh, yes. or whatever you call it. Is that easy to understand? Because I, I confess, I, I, I got very lost in this part. So yeah, if yeah. I go so, back to that, does it make sense just to look at that? Yeah, somewhat. So in this case, the, the best candidate set, the least matched, you really want to think of as the candidates that offer the most gain. And so I have to look at this notion of gain in order to uh, to get anything even for the unweighted case? Um, using this framework, yes. Okay. Yeah. And, and really what's kind of happening under the hood is we have all these separate weight levels and each weight level you can really think of as almost an unweighted problem where you, um, you have to have consistency, but um, this is kind of what's, what's happening at the end of the day, at the end of the yes. day. Yeah, but yeah. No, I, I just wanted to understand the unweighted problem, but that's okay. It's, uh... Yeah, yeah. No, no. So the, the least match are the ones that have the most potential of giving you gain. Like they're least likely to have received something. So when matching, you will pick up the most of the objective function. And this just generalizes um, that idea um, in, in some sense. But so this is the algorithm as given in the paper. And really what we keep track of at each, each value or for each offline vertex is the number of times this, this sort of case KW function, the number of randomized rounds in which an offline vertex I has been a top two candidate for a weight, um, an edge of weight, at least W. And then, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't mean to like go into the details here so much, but I just kind of want to highlight that this, this is all there is to the algorithm. And what this does is if we if we know the number of times that an element has appeared in a top in um as a top two candidate, then we have a good bound on the number on the chance that it's actually been matched, um, and this kind of connects us to the OCS now, where the number of times that a an element has um, appeared in this stream like of pairs, uh, we have you know a better than random chance that it, the algorithm actually accepts it and makes a match there. And so right, so these like randomized gain and deterministic gain values. Um, are really just these, um, yeah, functions that we can compute. And so it's like, if, if you take a look at it in the paper, it kind of looks um, intense, but it's really, really what these are is that we're summing up these sort of increments. We're kind of gradually incre increasing these slabs at different weight levels by predetermined values, uh, which we compute using a factory revealing linear program. And I'll just make a, a quick comment on this before going to, I guess, to questions, but, the main message here is that in every step, we can compute some notion of the gain to the objective function if we make a random assignment or make a deterministic assignment. And all that we have to do here is to keep track of the number of times we've seen an offline variable um, as a candidate for a certain weight threshold. And then from here, we kind of quantify it. We, we quantify these gains and make some kind of decision using the OCS as a black box. And so I'm going to skip over the analysis for, for the sake of um, time, since we're almost out of time, and I want to yeah, field questions. But what really happens under the hood is that we've, we've seen this connection, like the expected output of the algorithm is equal to the primal objective um, in the linear program. And the main idea is that then the primal objective, we, lower, we get a good lower bound on it using the guarantees from the OCS. Because what we wanted to keep track of was the exact probability that we've matched to an offline vertex at a given weight threshold. But we use the OCS to get a good lower bound based on the number of times we've seen it um, as a candidate. And then um, that then allows us, like allows everything else to go through. And what then happens is we, we, we have a set of conditions that we need to satisfy for the online primal framework to work. But it turns out that um, all, that we need, all that we need for this is you can write it all down and it ends up being a linear program that you can then you know, opt optimize these um, sort of like these values of A and B. They, the way we redistribute the, 
the gain to the dual variables um, you know, in a way that we want to maximize gamma. So yeah, uh, I'm not going to go into it, but basically when we write down the conditions we needed to satisfy the um, online probable dual framework and we want to maximize the competitive ratio, we can just solve a finite linear program to get a good approximation. This then gives us values of A and B that we use to design the algorithm, which inform basically uh, the, the, these gain, like randomized gain and deterministic gain update um, values. So yeah, it's kind of like, we don't just design an algorithm and then analyze it. It's kind of like goes hand in hand with what would be, would be happening in the analysis. Um, so I'm gonna kind of end there. There is, um, yeah, I have something um, here to kind of show how we construct the simpler OCS that gives us this guarantee, you know, when we choose an element from this stream of pairs. And it's not super complicated to get the simpler 1 16th version, but I'll maybe save that for an offline discussion. I know there's gonna be a bit of a discussion afterwards about both like um, career things at you know, Google research and kind of, you know, what that looks like. So if, if there's questions there, we can take some of the OCS questions uh, to that back half. But I guess I wanna end um, with following kind of a handful of open questions. Uh, the first being, um, yeah, what is the largest value of gamma, the strongest amount of negative correlation you can kind of get from some kind of online correlated selection algorithm? Uh, we know that we can't have gamma equals one because that would lead to infeasibility results. Um, but yeah, it, can one do better than the 0.1099 that we have computed? Almost definitely, but uh, unclear how. Are there so, ways Matthew, to- can you yes. can you achieve like 0.99? 0 0.99. Uh, well, yeah, I, I, it's unclear. I, I, we don't know. Probably so not. But we, we, we just don't, we know that we can't achieve one, correct. but anything correct. else is open. Yeah, as far as I know. I mean, just from like immediate results. I, I'm sure that someone could probably find, show that 0.99 is not doable, but, but maybe, maybe not, yeah. Um, right. And then there's this question of whether or not multi-way OCSs are useful. So rather than taking a pair of elements, if we are allowed to feed multiple elements to the OCS at each step, um, can, can someone somehow do better? The answer seems kind of promising there actually. And then in general, yeah, OCS was useful for this AdWords problem to kind of break the one half barrier there as well. And lastly, kind of the main real question here is in general for this edge weighted by dimension problem, we're gonna need new techniques. Like this was a way to get past the longstanding one half barrier, but we know already that there's an upper bound of, that, of five nights. You know, in the event that we had a perfect OCS with gamma equals one, we still probably can't get even close to one minus one over E, you know, unless that's not, not the real uh, upper bound for edge weighted case. So these are just some natural questions that stem from our work. And yeah, with that, I'll, I'll take some questions, but yeah, really the goal was to kind of um, make, the, make the paper easier to read if, if you go in and read it and kind of demonstrate how some of the pieces uh, do come together here, in particular how we use this OCS and what it looks like. So yeah, with that, I'll go ahead and, and take questions, but yeah, thanks for the invitation to talk and I'll move back to this, this slide for the moment. Now for questions. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi, Hi. Matt. I can ask. Oh. One question. Okay. So, um, th this might just help me uh, with my understanding of the algorithm. Yeah. So, what's the point of leaving a, a, an edge on a, a vertex that comes in online unmatched? Because with the free disposal, we can already like uh, replace that. Yeah. So we would the algorithm would only enter an unmatched round if mm -hmm. all of its neighbors, um, with certainty, were already matched. And the only way that would happen is if they had been matched, I guess, in, in deterministic rounds earlier on. Otherwise, there is some uncertainty that they will remain unmatched. Mm -hmm. And then it would do that. Yeah, so it, it's more of kind of a corner case in some sense. And the only way one enters a deterministic round is if it's its only, kind of it's its only neighbor. Yeah, and then my, <clears throat> my other question, I think one of the slides is said that the algorithm is not fully adaptive. Yeah. And yeah, oh, what is that? What is that? Okay, yeah, so this is something that it, it is the most kind of critical and subtle piece of this whole algorithm. Um, basically, the, what I mean by that is that 
the algorithm, when it, when it, when it is going to make a new match and a new time step, it doesn't look at the current state. It doesn't actually peek into what has happened in the past, the yes, previous assignments. It's operating under what it, like the expected um, state up to that point. And the it reason that's- you need to know the realization of the randomness that it exactly. itself uses. Right. Okay. And the reason that's useful is because when we then go through the primal dual framework, the, the primal is kind of, um, we're summing over the expected match um, for, for each of the offline, uh, to each of the offline vertices. And so there needs to be some like positive gain for each of those in some sense. And this is kind of what connects us to the on, online correlated selection black box is that there, there needs to be some chance for each of these offline vertices in like a systematic way, oh. at least with our first cut of the analysis and approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so like you would, you would think by realizing it, you're not gonna do worse, but then analyzing it becomes very hard. Um, so, so yeah, it's this kind of weird algorithm that operates solely in an expected state. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it, it was hard to convey and I'm, yeah, sorry for the confusion early on, but that's how it's doing. That's Very what it's cool doing. So, thanks. You're welcome. So uh, I had a question. So is sure. there any connection of the OCS to something like online vertex cover? Uh, because you're sort of trying to pick, I mean, you think of these pairs as edges and you're picking a vertex cover and you want the high degree vertices to be more likely to be picked. So is there yeah, yeah. some perspective there? Uh, haven't thought about it, but sounds extremely relevant. And um, yeah, we haven't admittedly thought about improving the OCS too much. I know there are other teams working on it right now and I've seen kind of some of their, their progress, but yeah, I, I, um, I don't know. Haven't actually thought about it. But yeah, I mean, that, that is kind of the point of the OCS is that you do have this stream and it's doing something, you know, not super sophisticated, but it is doing better than random assignments in each step, right? You are, you are, you're making this guarantee that, you know, it's, it's sort of adaptive, right? Um, it kind of uses previous information, but never, never, review, never realizes it and it doesn't use it in too strong of a way. Yeah, but no, it's a, a, a good thing to think about. Very good. Um, I had a question about the the top two. If you could, if you had intuition sure. for why the, the top two, and but I guess this slide is saying that you do top two just because you know how to analyze this. Yeah, so exactly. Um, more is probably useful, but so basically going from one to two is kind of critical, like that's necessary. Um, and then it, two is enough. I think that's the, that's the, that's the main message. That's the point. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, diminishing returns maybe in terms of like gain versus complexity of analysis. Thanks. Yeah. No problem. But I will say that, yeah, for, for, there is a bit of a positive answer to this kind of underway where people have shown that if you have these super magical OCSs, it's, it's made, like these aren't, these aren't publicly available results yet, but if you have like very, very, very strong OCSs, you can get a lot of, uh, make a lot of progress on competitive ratios. And then, it's, then it can become a question of, is such an OCS, can you create it? And um, yeah, there seems to be kind of this, uh, some trade-offs under the hood on the OCS. So this is the first cut of the definition of an online correlated selection idea. But I, I think even this can be refined in a way that gives you more strength, but then it's harder to create. And um, this is just a one position in that uh, like sort of slider. Cool, any other questions? Even, yeah, even going back to, I guess, kind of the, the, the basic ideas of the, the earlier algorithms or kind of how we even arrived to um, needing to do some kind of correlated selection. Yeah, I realized that the um, sort of thought experiment got a little confusing. Um, 